Chapter 47 I go after him. I'm following Adam down an empty corridor as he exits the dining hall, even though I know I shouldn't. I know I shouldn't be talking to him like this, shouldn't be encouraging the feelings I have for him, but I'm worried. I can't help it. He's disappearing into himself, withdrawing into a world I can't penetrate and I can't even blame him for. I can only imagine what he must be experiencing right now. These recent revelations would be enough to drive a weaker person absolutely insane. And even though we've managed to work together lately, it's always been during such high-stress situations that there's hardly been any time for us to dwell on our personal issues. And I need to know that he's all right. I can't just stop caring about him. Adam? He stops at the sound of my voice. His spine goes rigid with surprise. He turns around and I see his expression shift from hope to confusion to worry in a matter of seconds. What's wrong? He asks. Is everything okay? Suddenly he's in front of me, all six feet of him, and I'm drowning in memories and feelings that I've made no effort to forget. I'm trying to remember why I wanted to talk to him, why I ever told him we couldn't be together, why I would ever keep myself from a chance at even five seconds in his arms, and he's saying my name, saying, Juliet, what's wrong? Did something happen? I want so, so desperately to say yes, yes, horrible things have happened and I'm sick. I'm so sick and tired and I really just want to collapse in your in your arms and forget the rest of the world. Instead, I managed to look up, managed to meet his eyes. They're such a dark, haunting shade of blue. I'm worried about you, I tell him. And his eyes are immediately different, uncomfortable, closed off. You're worried about me. He blows out a hard breath, runs a hand through his hair. I just wanted to make sure you were okay. He shakes his head in disbelief. What are you doing? He says. Are you mocking me? What? He's pounding a closed fist against his lips, looking up, looking like he's not sure what to say, and then he speaks, his voice strained and hurt and confused, and he says, You broke up with me. You gave, you gave up on us, on our entire future together. You basically reached in and ripped my heart out, and now you're asking me if I'm okay? How the hell am I supposed to be okay, Juliet? What kind of a question is that? I'm swaying in place. I didn't mean... I... I was just... I was talking about your, your dad. I thought maybe... Oh, God, I'm sorry. You're right. I'm so stupid. I shouldn't have come. I, should, I shouldn't... Juliet... He says, so desperately, catching me around the waist as I back away. His eyes are shut tight. Please, he says, tell me what I'm supposed to do. How am I supposed to feel? It's one shitty thing right after another, and I'm trying to be okay. God, I'm trying so hard, but it's really freaking difficult, and I miss... His voice catches. I miss you, he says. I miss you so much, it's killing me. My fingers are clenched in his shirt. My heart is hammering in the silence. I see the difficulty he has in meeting my eyes when he whispers, Do you still love me? And I'm straining every muscle in my body just to keep myself from reaching forward to touch him. Adam, of course I still love you. You know, he says, his voice rough with emotion. I never had anything like this before. I can barely remember my mom. And other than that, it was just me and James and my piece of shit dad. And James has always loved me in his own way. But you, with you... He falters, looks down. How am I supposed to go back? He asks so quietly. How am I supposed to forget what it was like to be with, you, to be loved by you? I don't even realize I'm crying until it's too late. You say you love me, he says. And I know I love you. He looks up, meets my eyes. So why the hell can't we be together? And I don't know how to say anything about... And I don't know how to say anything, but I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You have no idea how sorry I am. Why can't we just try? He's gripping my shoulders. He's gripping my shoulders now. His words urgent, anguished. Our face is too dangerously close. I'm willing to take whatever I can get. I swear. I just want to know I have you in my life. We can't. I tell him. It won't be enough, Adam. And you know it. One day we'll take a stupid risk or take a chance we shouldn't. One day we'll think it'll be okay and it won't and it won't end well. But look at us now, he says. We can make this work. I can be close to you without kissing you. I just need to spend a few more months of training. Your training might never be enough, I cut him off, knowing I need to tell him everything now, knowing he has a right to know the same things I do. Because the more I train... The more I learn exactly how dangerous I am, and you can't be near me. It's not just my skin anymore. I could hurt you just by holding your hand. 
What? He, he blinked several times. What are you talking about? I take a deep breath and press my palm flat against the side of the tunnel before digging my fingers in and dragging them across right through the stone. I punch my fist into the wall and grab a handful of rough rock, crush it in my hand, allow it to sift as sand through my fingers to the floor. Adam is staring at me, astonished. I'm the one who shot your father. I tell him. I don't know why Kenji was covering for me. I don't know why he didn't tell you the truth, but I was so blinded by this. This all-consuming rage. I just wanted to kill him, and I was torturing him, I whisper. I shot him in his legs because I was taking my time, because I wanted to enjoy that last moment, that last bullet I was about to put through his heart. And I was so close. I was so close. And Kenji, I tell him, Kenji had to pull me away because he saw that I'd gone insane. I'm out of control. My voice is a rasp, a broken plea. I don't know what's wrong with me or what's happening to me, and I don't even know what I'm capable of yet. Of yet. I don't know how much worse this is going to get. Every day I learn something new about myself, and every day it terrifies me. I've done terrible things to people, I whisper. I swallow back the sob building in my throat. And I'm, I'm not okay, I tell him. I'm not okay, Adam. I'm not okay, and I'm not safe for you to be around. He's staring at me, so stunned he's forgotten how to speak. Now you know that the rumors are true, I whisper. I am crazy, and I am a monster. No, he breathes. No. Yes. No, he says, desperate now. That's not true. You're stronger than this. I know you are. I know you, he says. I've known your heart for ten years, he says. And I've seen what you had to live through, what you had to go through. And I'm not giving up on you now. Not because of this, not because of something like this. How can you say that? How can you still believe that after everything, after all of this? You, he says to me, his hands gripping my knee tighter now, are one of the bravest, strongest people I've ever met. You have the best heart, the best intentions. He stops, takes a tight, shaky breath. You're the best person I've ever known, he says to me. You've been through the worst possible experiences and you survived with your humanity still intact. How the hell, he says, his voice breaking now. Am I supposed to let you go? How can I walk away from you? Adam, no, he says, shaking his head. I refuse to believe that this is the end of us. Not if you still love me, because you're going to get through this, he says. And I will be waiting for you when you're ready. I'm not going anywhere. There won't be another person for me. You're the only one I've ever wanted, and that's never, he says, that's never going to change. How touching, Adam and I freeze. Turn around slowly to face the unwelcome voice. He's right there. Warner is standing right in front of us, his hands tied behind his back, his eyes blazing bright with anger and hurt and disgust. Castle comes up behind him to lead him in whatever, whichever, wherever direction he sees where Warner is stuck, still staring at us, and Adam is like one block of marble, not moving, not making the effort to breathe or speak or look away. I'm fairly certain I'm burning so bright I've burnt to a crisp. You're so lovely when you're blushing, Warner says to me. But I really wish you wouldn't waste your affections on someone who has to beg for your love. He cocks his head at Adam. How sad for you, he says. This must be terribly embarrassing. You sick bastard, Adam says to him, his voice like steel. At least I still have my dignity. Castle shakes his head, exasperated, pushes Warner forward. Please get back to work, both of you. He shouts at us as he and Warner make their way past. You're wasting valuable time standing out here. You can go to hell, Adam shouts at Warner. Just because I'm going to hell, Warner says, doesn't mean you'll ever deserve her. And Adam doesn't answer. He just watches, eyes focused, as Warner and Castle disappear around the corner. Chapter 48 James joins us during our training session before dinner. He's been hanging out with us a lot since we got back, and we all seem happier when he's around. There's something about his presence that's so disarming, so welcome. It's so good to have him back. I've been showing him how easily I can break things now. The bricks are nothing. It feels like crushing a piece of cake. The metal pipes bend in my hands like a plastic straw. What is a little tricky because if I break it the wrong way, I can catch a splinter, but just about nothing is difficult anymore. Kenji has been thinking of new ways to test my abilities. Lately, he's been trying to see if I can project if I can focus my power from a distance. Not all abilities are designed for projection. 
apparently. Lily, for example, has that incredible photographic memory, but she'd never be able to project that ability onto anyone else. Projection is by far the most difficult thing I've ever attempted to do. It's extremely complicated and requires both mental and physical exertion. I have to be wholly in control of my mind, and I have to know exactly how both my how my brain communicates with with oh I cannot speak. I have to be wholly in control of my mind, and I have to know exactly how my brain communicates with whatever invisible bone in my body is responsible for my gift, which means I have to know how to locate the source of my ability and how to focus it into one concentrated point of power. Oh, I can tap into from anywhere. It's hurting my brain. Can I try to break something too? James is asking. He grabs one of the bricks off the stack and weighs it in his hands. Maybe I'm super strong like you. Have you ever felt super strong? Kenji asks him, like you know abnormally strong. No, James says, but I've never tried to break anything either. He blinks at Kenji. Do you think maybe I could be like you guys? That maybe I could have some kind of power too? Kenji studies him, seems to be sorting some things out in his head. Says, it's definitely possible. Your brother's obviously got something in his DNA, which means you might too. Really? James is practically jumping up and down. Kenji chuckles. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm just saying it might be possible. No. He shouts. James. Oops. James is wincing, dropping the brick to the floor and clenching his fist against the gash, bleeding in the palm of his hand. I think I pressed too hard and it slipped, he says, struggling not to cry. You think? Kenji is shaking his head, breathing fast. Damn, kid, you can't just go around slicing your hand open like that. You're going to give me a freaking heart attack. Come here, he says more gently now. Let me take a look. It's okay, James says, cheeks flushed, hiding his hand behind his back. It's nothing. It'll go away. It'll go away soon. That kind of cut is not just going to go away, Kenji says. Now let me take a look at it. Wait, I interrupt him, caught by the intense look on James's face, the way he seems to be so focused on the clenched fist he's hiding. James, what do you mean it'll go away? Do you mean it's going to get, get better on its own? Well, yeah, it always gets better really quickly. What does? What gets better really quickly? Kiji is staring too now, already catching onto my theory and throwing looks at me, mouthing holy shit over and over again. When I get hurt, James says, looking at us like we've lost our minds, like if you cut yourself. He says to Kenji, wouldn't it just get better? It depends on the size of the cut, Kenji tells him. But for a gash like the one on your hand, he shakes his head. I need to clean it to make sure it didn't get infected. Then I'd have to wrap it up in gauze and some kind of ointment to keep it from scarring. And then, he says, it would take at least a couple of days for it to scab up and then it would begin to heal. James is blinking like he's never heard of something so absurd in his life. Let me see your hand, Kenji says to him. James hesitates. It's all right, I tell him. Really, we're just curious. Slowly, so slowly, James shows us his clenched fist. Even more slowly, he uncurls his fingers, watching our reactions the whole time. And exactly where just a moment ago there was a huge gash, now there's nothing but perfect pink skin and a little pool of blood. Holy shit on a cracker! Kenji breathes. Sorry, he says to me, jumping forward to grab James's arm, barely able to rein in his smile. But I need to get this guy over to the medical wing. That okay? We can pick up again tomorrow. But I'm not hurt anymore, James protests. I'm okay. I know, kid, but you're going to want to come with me. But why? How would you like, he says, leading James out the door, to start spending some time with two very pretty girls? And they're gone. And I'm laughing, sitting in the middle of the training room all by myself when I hear two familiar knocks at my door. I already know who it's going to be. Miss Ferrars? I whip around, not because I'm surprised to hear Castle's voice, but because I'm surprised at the in in intonation. His eyes are narrow, his lips tight, his eyes sharp and flashing in, in this light. He is very, very angry. Crap. I'm sorry about the hallway, I tell him. I didn't. We can discuss your public and wildly inappropriate displays of affection at a later time, Miss Farage, but right now I have a very important question to ask you, and I would advise you to be honest, as acutely honest as it is physically possible. 
What? I can hardly breathe. What is it? Castle narrows his eyes at me. I have just had a conversation with Warner who says he is able to touch you without consequence and that this information is something you are well aware of. And I think, wow, I did it. I actually managed to die of a stroke at 17. I need to know, Castle hurries on, whether or not this information is true and I need to know right now. There's glue all over my tongue, stuck to my teeth, my lips, the roof of my mouth, and I can't speak. I can't move. I'm pretty sure I just had a seizure or an aneurysm or a heart failure or something equally as awful, but I can't explain any of this to Castle because I can't move my jaw even an inch. Miss Farrar's, I don't think you understand how important this question is. I need an answer from you, and I need it in thirty. I need it thirty seconds ago. I, I, today I need an answer today, right now, this very moment. Yes. I choke out, blushing through my skull, horribly ashamed, embarrassed, horrified in every possible way. And the only thing I can think of is Adam, Adam, Adam. How will Adam respond to this information now? Why does, does this have to happen now? Why did Warner say anything at all? And I want to kill him for sharing the secret that was mine to tell, mine to hide, mine to hoard. The castle looks like he's a balloon that fell in love with a pushpin that got too close and ruined him forever. So it's true then. I drop my eyes. Yes, it's true. He falls to the floor right across from me, astonished. How is it even possible, do you think? Because Warner is Adam's brother, I don't tell him. And I don't tell him because it is Adam's secret to tell, and I will not talk about it until he does, even though I desperately want to tell Castle that the connection must be in their blood, that they both must share a similar kind of gift or energy or, oh, oh, oh God, oh no, Warner is one of us. Chapter 49. It changes everything. Castle doesn't even look at me. This, I mean, this means so many things, he says. We'll have to tell him everything and we'll have to test him to be sure, but I'm fairly positive it's the only explanation. And he would be welcome to take refuge here if you wanted it. I would have to give him a regular room, allow him to live among us as an equal. I cannot keep him here as a prisoner at the very least. What? But Castle, why? He's the one who almost killed Adam and Kenji. You have to understand, this news might change his entire outlook on life. Castle is shaking his head, one hand almost covering his mouth, his eyes wide. He might not take it well. He might be thrilled. He might lose his mind completely. He might wake up a new man in the morning. You would be surprised that these kinds of revelations will do to people. Okay, sorry for that little interruption there. I had a phone call. <clears throat> Omega Point will always be a place of refuge for our kind, he continues. It's an oath I made to myself many years ago. I cannot deny him food and shelter if, for example, his father were to cast him out entirely. This can't be happening. But I don't understand, Castle says suddenly, looking up at me. Why didn't you say anything? Why not report this information? This is important for us to know, and it doesn't condemn you in any way. I didn't want Adam to know. I admit out loud for the first time, my voice six broken bits of shame strung together. I just, I shake my head. I didn't want him to know. Castle actually looks sad for me. He says, I wish I could help you keep your secret, Miss Farrar's, but even if I wanted to, I'm not sure Warner will. I focus on the mats laid out on the floor. My voice sounds tiny when I ask, why did he tell you? Why did he even tell you? I did that, e how did that even come up in conversation? Castle rubs his chin thoughtful. He told me of his own accord. I volunteered to take him on his daily rounds, walking him to the restroom, etc., because I wanted to follow up and ask him questions about his father and see what he knew about the, the state of our hostages. He seemed perfectly fine. In fact, he looked much better than he was when he first showed up. He was compliant, almost polite, but his attitude changed rather dramatically after we stumbled on you and Adam in the hall. His voice trails off, his eyes snap up, his mind working quickly to fit all the pieces together, and he's gaping at me, staring at me in a way that is entirely foreign to Castle, in a way that he says he is utterly, absolutely baffled. I'm not sure if I should be offended. He's in love with you. Adam, or Castle, whispers a dawning, groundbreaking realization in his voice. He laughs once, hard, fast, shakes his head. He held you captive and managed to fall in love with you in the process. I'm staring at the mats like they're the most fascinating things I've ever seen in my life. 
Oh, Miss Ferrars, Castle says to me, I do not envy you your predicament. I can see now why this situation must be uncomfortable for you. I want to say to him, you have no idea, Castle. You have no idea because you don't even know the entire story. You don't know that they're brothers. Brothers who hate each other. Brothers who only seem to agree on one thing, and that one thing happens to be killing their own father. But I don't say any of those things. I don't say anything, in fact. I sit on these mats with my head in my hands, and I'm trying to figure out what else could possibly go wrong. I'm wondering how many more mistakes I'll have to make before things fall, finally fall into place, if they ever will. Chapter 50 I'm so humiliated. I've been thinking about this all night, and I came to a realization this morning. Warner must have told Castle on purpose, because he's playing games with me, because he hasn't changed, because he's still trying to get me to do his bidding. He's still trying to get me to be his project, and he's trying to hurt me. I won't allow it. I will not allow Warner to lie to me, to manipulate my emotions to get what he wants. I can't believe I felt pity for him, that I felt weakness, tenderness for him when I saw him with his father, that I believed him when he told me his thoughts about my journal. I'm such a gullible fool. I was an idiot to ever think he might be capable of human emotion. I told Castle that maybe he should put someone else on this assignment now that he knows Warner can touch me. I told him it might be dangerous now, but he laughed and, la and he laughed and he laughed and he said, Oh, Miss Ferrars, I'm quite, quite certain you will be able to defend yourself. In fact, you're probably much better equipped against him than any of us. Besides, he added, this is an ideal situation. If he truly is in love with you, you must be able to use that to our advantage somehow. We need your help, he said to me, serious again. We need all the help we can find, and right now you're the one person who might be able to get the answers we need. Please, he said. Try to find out anything you can, anything at all. Winston and Brendan's lives are at risk. And he's right. Oh, and he's right. <laughs> so I'm shoving my own concerns aside because Winston and Brendan are out there, hurting somewhere, and we need to find them. And I'm going to do whatever I can to help, which means I have to talk to Warner again. I have to treat him just like the prisoner that he is. No more side conversations. No falling for his efforts to confuse me. Not again and again and again. I'm going to be better, smarter, and I want my notebook back. The guards were unlocking his room for me, and I'm marching in. I'm sealing the door shut behind me, and I'm getting ready to give him the speech I've already prepared when I stop in place. I don't know what I was expecting. Maybe I thought I'd catch him trying to break a hole in the wall, or maybe he'd be plotting the demise of every person at Omega Point, or I don't know, I don't know, I don't know anything, because I only know how to fight an angry body, an insolent creature, an arrogant monster, and I do not know what to do with this. He's sleeping. Someone put a mattress in here, a simple rectangle of average quality, thin and warm, but better than the ground, at least, and he's lying on top of it in nothing but a pair of black boxer briefs. His clothes are on the floor. His pants, his shirts, his socks are slightly damp, wrinkled, obviously hand-washed, and laid out to dry. His coat is folded neatly over his boots, and his gloves are resting right next to each other on top of his, his coat. He hasn't moved an inch since I stepped into the room. He is resting on his side, his back to the wall, his left arm tucked under his face, his right arm against his torso, his entire body bare, strong, smooth, and smelling faintly of soap. I don't know why I can't stop staring at him. I don't know what it is about sleep that makes our faces appear so soft and innocent, so peaceful and vulnerable, but I'm trying to look away, and I can't. I'm losing sight of my own purpose, forgetting all the brave things I said to myself before I stepped in here, because there's something about him. There's always been something about him that's intrigued me, and I don't understand it. I wish I could ignore it, but I can't. Because I look at him and, I, and wonder if maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm naive. But I see layers, shades of gold and green, and a person who's never been given a chance to be human. And I wonder if I'm just as cruel as my own oppressors if I decide that society is right, that some people are too far gone, that sometimes you can't turn back, that there are people in this world who don't deserve a second chance. And I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't help but disagree. I can't help but think that 19 is too young to give up on someone, that 19 year old. 19 years old is just the beginning that it's too soon to tell anyone they will never amount to anything but evil in this world. I can't help but wonder what my life would have been like if someone had taken a chance on me. So I back away. I turn to leave. I let him sleep. I stop in place. I catch a glimpse of my notebook lying on the mattress next to his outstretched hand, his fingers looking as if they've only just let go. It's the perfect opportunity to steal it back if I can be stealthy enough. 
I tiptoe forward, forever grateful that these boots I wear are designed to make no sound at all. But the closer I inch toward his body, the more attention is caught by something on his back. A little rectangular blur of black. A creep, I creep closer. Blink. Squint. Lean in. It's a tattoo. No pictures, just one word. One word typed into the very center of his upper back in ink. Ignite. And his skin is shredded with scars. Blood is rushing to my head so quickly I'm beginning to feel faint. I feel sick, like I might actually truly upturn the contents of my stomach right now. I want to panic. I want to shake someone. I want to know how to understand the emotions choking me because I can't even imagine. Can't even imagine. Can't even imagine what he must have endured to carry such suffering on his skin. His entire back is a map of pain. Thick and thin and uneven and terrible. Scars like roads that lead to nowhere. They're gashes and ragged slices I can't understand, marks of torture I never could have expected. They're the only imperfections on his entire body, imperfections hidden away and hiding secrets of their own. And I realize, not for the first time, that I have no idea who Warner really is. Juliet? I freeze. What are you doing here? His eyes are wide, alert. I, I came to talk to you. Jesus, he gasps, Chet jumping away from me. I'm very flattered, love, but... You could have at least given me a chance to put on my pants. <laughs> He's pulled himself up against the wall, but makes no effort to grab his clothes. His eyes keep darting from me to the pants on the floor like he doesn't know what to do. He seems determined not to turn his back, in back to me. Would you mind? He says, nodding to the clothes next to my feet and affecting an air of nonchalance that does little to hide the apprehension in his eyes. It's getting chilly in here. But I'm staring at him, staring at the length of him, awed by how incredibly flawless he looks from the front. Strong, lean frame, and tone, toned and muscular without being bulky. He's fair without being pale, skin tinted with just enough sunlight to look effortlessly healthy, the body of a perfect boy. What a lie appearance. What a lie appearances can be. What a terrible, terrible lie. His gaze is fixed on mine, his eyes green flames that will not extinguish, and his chest is rising and falling so fast, so fast, so fast. What happened to your back? I hear myself whisper. I watch as the color drains from his face. He looks away, runs a hand across his mouth, his chin down the back of his neck. Who hurt you? I ask, so quietly. I'm beginning to recognize the strange feeling I get just before I do something terrible, like right now. Right now, I feel like I could kill someone for this. Julia, please, my pearls. Was it your father? I ask, my voice a little sharper. Did he do this to you? It doesn't matter. Warner cuts me off, frustrated now. Of course it matters, he says, nothing. That tattoo, I say to him, that word? Yes, he says, though he says it quietly, clears his throat. I don't, I blink. What does it mean? Warner shakes his head, runs a hand through his hair. Is it from a book? Why do you care? He asks, looking away again. Why are you suddenly so interested in my life? I don't know. I want to tell him. I want to tell him I don't know, but that's not true. Because I feel it. I feel the clicks and the turns and the creaking of a million keys unlocking a million doors in my mind. It's like I'm finally allowing myself to see what, what I really think, how I really feel, like I'm discovering my own secrets for the first time. And then I search his eyes, search his features for something I can't even name, and I realize I don't want to be his enemy anymore. It's over. I'd say to him, I'm not on base with you this time. I'm not going to be your weapon, and you'll never be able to change my mind about that. I think you know that now. I study the floor. So why are we still fighting each other? Why are you still trying to manipulate me? Why are you still trying to get me to fall for your tricks? <clears throat> I have no idea, he says, looking at me like he's not sure I'm even real. No idea what you're talking about. Why did you tell Castle you could touch me? That wasn't your secret to share. Right. He exhales a deep breath. Of course. He seems to return to himself. Listen, love, could you at least toss me my jacket if you're going to stay here and ask me all these questions? I toss him his jacket. He catches it, slides down to the floor, and instead of putting his jacket on, he drapes it over his lap. Finally, he says, Yes, I did tell Castle I could touch you. He had a right to know. That wasn't any of his business. Of course it's his business, Warner says. The entire world he's created down here thrives on exactly that kind of information, and you're here living among them. He should know. He doesn't need to know. Why is it such a big deal? He asks, studying my eyes too carefully. 
Why does it bother you so much for someone to know that I can touch you? Why does it have to be a secret? I struggle to find the words that won't come. Are you worried about Kent? You think he'd have a problem knowing I can touch you? I didn't want him to find out like this. But why does it matter? He insists. You seem to care so much about something that makes no difference in your personal life. It wouldn't, he says, make any difference in your personal life. Not if you still claim to feel nothing but hatred for me. Because that's what you said, isn't it? That you hate me. I fold myself to the floor across from Moira, pull my knees up to my chest, focus on the stone under my feet. I don't hate you. Warner seems to stop breathing. I think I understand you sometimes, I tell him. I really do, but just when I think I finally get you, you surprise me. I never really know who you are or who you're going to be. I look up. But I know that I don't hate you anymore. I've tried, I say. I've tried so hard because you've done so many terrible, terrible things to innocent people, to me. But I know too much about you now. Now. I've seen too much. You're too human. His hair is so gold, his eyes so green, his voice is tortured when he speaks. Are you saying, he says, that you want to be my friend? I I don't know. I'm so petrified, so, so petrified at this possibility. I didn't think about that. I'm just saying that I don't know. I hesitate. Breathe. I don't know how to hate you anymore, even though I want to. I really want to, and I know I should, but I just can't. He looks away. And he smiles. It's the kind of smile that makes me forget how to do everything but blink and blink. And I don't understand what's happening to me. I don't know why I can't convince my eyes to find something else to focus on. I don't know why my heart is losing its mind. He touches my notebook like he's not even aware he's doing it. His fingers run the length of the cover once, twice, before he registers where my eyes have gone and he stops. You wrote these words. He touches the notebook again, every single one. I nod. He says, Juliet. I stop breathing. He says, I would like that very much. To be your friend. He says, I'd like that. And I don't really know what happens in my brain. Maybe it's because he's broken and I'm foolish enough to think I can fix him. Maybe it's because I see myself. I see three, four, five, six, seventeen-year-old Juliet abandoned, neglected, mistreated, abused for something outside of her control, and I think of Warner as someone who's just like me, someone who was never given a chance at life. I think about how everyone already hates him, how hating him is a universally accepted fact. Warner is horrible. There are no discussions, no reservations, no questions asked. It has already been decided that he is a despicable human be being who thrives on murder and power and torturing others. But I want to know. I need to know. I have to know. If it's really that simple. Because what if one day I slip? What if one day I fall through the cracks and no one is willing to pull me back? What happens to me? So I meet his eyes. I take a breath. And I run. I run right out the door.